Tom Cheatham, uh, welcome to Radio Wolf. I'm very excited that I have this opportunity to talk to you. Thank you for having me. It should be fun. I, as I just told you, I follow your work since a couple of years. My friend John Baveki uh, brought um, uh, your work to my attention. And uh, you are originally a scientist, a biologist, if I say, uh, mm -hmm. if, I, if I remember right. Uh, but you are a philosopher, writer, and you are very dedicated to uh, the work of a French philosopher, uh, Henri Corbin, who is not too well known, but he gets quite some reputation by now, I, I would say, yeah. about something very specific, uh, which is his approach to Im imagination and the, important, the importance of imagination uh, for how we perceive the world and even uh, for our understanding what the world is, because uh, the way our Western, modern, postmodern perspective on, on, on world is very much focused on the factual. And there's mm. kind of a very scientific understanding of re what the reality is. And uh, we are very much used to uh, define this as reality, what scientifically can be understood as reality. And uh, following your work and Henri Combeur's work and er everything he comes from, Imagination seems to be something that is worth to have a closer look. It's more than it seems to be. And <laughs> I would like to yeah. basically uh, to hear from you. Uh, how is it that imagination is something that um, seems to be important for our culture? Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so... Uh, you know, one of the, maybe a good way for me to try to talk about this is um, to, 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 to reiterate the fact that my training uh, as, as, a, as an undergraduate in my teens and 20s, I, I was a, a philosopher, student of philosophy, but then my graduate training is mostly in the sciences. Um, so I'm very familiar with um, a, a scientific view of reality. And um, I'm very sympathetic to scientific views of reality. And yet, um, what I have managed to convince myself of is that it's not just possible, but optimal to adhere to a vision of reality in which the sciences don't have primary access to the truth. And it took me a long time. That was that question of the nature of scientific truth and how to almost literally get around it, get outside of it. That was the real challenge for me. For other people, it might be um, religion um, or whatever your favorite ground metaphor for what constitutes reality is. You know, everybody at some level is literal about something. For, for some people, it's money. Money is what drives the world. For other people, it might be the laws of physics. For other people, it might be Darwin. For others, it might be Allah or the God of the Old Testament. Or And I wanted more than that. <laughs> That is to say, and I didn't, I didn't really know what I was looking for. 
But I wanted, <laughs> as it turns out, I was only going to be happy <laughs> with a sense of reality that had all of those things in it and that all of them spoke to some truth. Uh, William Blake says somewhere that everything that is possible to imagine is a vision of the truth, a partial vision. And so the way that I came to it was, um, oh, I suppose, I, I, having a kind of psychic crisis in my late 30s. And I was engaged in, um, oh, theoretical biology at the time in a very minor sort of way. But I just happened to cross a book by James Hillman, who is a sort of, he passed away a few years ago, but he's, he was a kind of um, radical um, uh, Jungian. And when I started reading Hillman, he said, everything that he talked about put imagination at the center of things. Now, he was a psychologist, although a bit more, more than that, but primarily a psychologist. And he just said, you know, everything that you do is, is imagination. No matter what you're doing is, is imagination. And his style and his examples and his obvious um, scholarly credentials really intrigued me. And I didn't have to read too much to have the sudden realization that this is it. This is what I've been looking for all my life. This huge vision of human potentiality based on the central doctrine of the power of the imagination. And so I needed to learn all about everything I could about C.G. Jung because Hillman was a Jungian. So I, I, I learned a bit of Jung and then I was a great fan of Hillman for a number of years. And just to make the story a little short, um, in one of his Aranos essays from the 80s, uh, Hillman talks about this French philosopher and theologian, Henri Corbin, who I'd never heard of. And Hillman obviously thought this guy was just amazing and the most profound exemplar of the imagination that he had ever seen. And I thought, well, if Hillman loves this guy, I've got to find out about him. So that was in 1991 or 92. And I got a hold of uh, the book by Corbin that he wrote about um, uh, Ibn Arabi, the, the Muslim mystic, 12th century mystic. It's called Creative Imagination and the Sufism of Ibn Arabi. And I thought, well, that's strange. This guy's a theologian, and he seems to be an expert in Islamic mysticism. But okay, I'll read it, you know. And, and for 30 years now, I've had a somewhat um, uh, ambivalent relationship with Henri Corbin. And it certainly was ambivalent to begin with. Be well, by the time you're on page two or three, I, I was in, I was places I had never expected to go. I'm reading about the Bible and the Quran and Moses and angels. And I just thought, what is this about? <laughs> But then on the, on the very first page, if you're attentive, you will notice that he says something like, with the help of phenomenology, we are now not um, puzzled by claims about the cognitive 
function of sympathy or love or any other emotion. And I thought, I know a little bit about phenomenology because I know a little bit about Husserl and Heidegger, but I never heard anybody say this, <laughs> that with the help of phenomenology, we're now able to freely think about the cognitive function of love and its ability to create and bring into being objects <laughs> about which it gives us cognition. And, uh, you know, and you don't have to go too far into Corbin's work when it becomes quite clear that the reason he thinks this vision of reality, and it was not, it took me many, many years to get clear about his vision of reality. But he said, the only way we can do this is by putting the imagination at the center of everything. And so I just couldn't put his books down. Uh, for a very long time, I just, I'd, I'd, get, I'd get frustrated with all the angels and I'd get frustrated with the Bible and the Quran. And then I'd think, boy, I don't know, there's something in here. This is really interesting. And to compress at least 20 years of frustrations, I think what Corbin gave me that I couldn't quite get from Jung or Hillman was access to the religious imagination, the theological imagination and the mystical imagination. You, you can probably get that, certainly from Jung, maybe not so much from Hillman, but there were a variety of things that I needed that Henri Corbin was uniquely positioned to be able to give me. And now, just to draw it into a little bit of a ball, I've been thinking about Corbin's work for so long that I try to be very careful not to say anything terribly explicit about what he thought, because I'm so tangled up in the ideas that he gave me that I can't really distinguish me from him very well anymore. But the position that I was able to adopt, thanks in large measure to Corbin, is a very firm, um, I don't want to say it's a belief because it's not a belief, but a very uh, solid stance towards reality which acknowledges the partiality of every attempt that we make to understand the world as a whole. And there's lots of ways to frame that, but for me, the, if, you're, if your largest category is the imagination, and then, and then you're willing to leave that undefined, <laughs> um, then that works for me to tie together the physical, the emotional, and the intellectual in a way that I, I found unable to discover any other way there. How's that? <laughs> I find very intriguing because just as you stopped here, uh, the question on my mind was the way you're describing it, also your whole journey uh, from being a biologist through uh, finding Corbin, also being quite frustrated with all the angels, but also intrigued by the uh, spiritual imagination. Uh, you came to a point where it seems there's something becomes visible 
that without that is not visible. There's the, there are the aspects of reality that need our imagination, or maybe it's even that every part of, uh, of reality needs our imagination in order to access it. So there's, there, there, there are scientific approaches and you have to measure things and you have to calculate th things and, uh, and, and there's a rationality about it. But if, if, if you look, even mathematics, even astronomy cannot go without imagination. Uh, that, and to honor this, and maybe this is also the phenomenological stand on this, to, to look carefully and appreciate that uh, imagination is somehow on, 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 the, on, on the fundament of everything. And then taking this serious allows us to have a different look on reality where it's not just about the measurement of things, but the capacity to see through imagination. Is that the thing that caught you so long? Uh, that the cover opened up for you? Or is this a, a misunderstanding? No, 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 that's 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 really right. And and I mean one of the things that once you have been trying to if you once you've been struggling with your own psyche for long enough, um uh one of the things you realize is that understanding with the head and understanding with the heart are, are two different things, but they're they're linked together. They they mm -hmm. really are linked together. So I I knew I knew I had a good rationale for a good solid defensible philosophical rationale for understanding the sciences in a certain in in a, in such a way that you didn't automatically give them full power over your life but that it there's 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 an emotional component to that that mm -hmm. takes in my experience a lot longer to work through and somehow and i'm I, i'm not entirely sure how Corbin's work spoke spoke to that. Be and oh, this is really hard to talk about. Um, because because the the shift which occurs is very subtle, and you can't you can't really put a finger. It's not like it's not like solving a problem in mathematics or in the sciences where aha suddenly you see the light it's it's it uh, to 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 go through this process of relativization of the of your fundamental realities takes a long time because it mm -hmm. requires it requ let's put it this way hmm. um it requ it requires a transformation of your whole life mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's you know for for some people like me i I'm, I'm a very into in, my intellect is way too strong that's not necessarily a good thing not necessarily a bad thing um but i do things head first and the rest comes later other people mm -hmm. are blessed with a different approach and they they have to dance something before they can understand it i have to think about it before i can dance it you know if i'm if I may come in here with a question that maybe goes somehow to the deep end. Uh, 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 and with the deep end, I mean something like angels. Uh, uh, and uh, at least for most of us, uh, angels is, are, is, is a strange concept. Uh, but there's, there's something uh, that I got, in fact, from Paul Tillich when he talks mm. about symbols. Mm. And I think this is very much related that really changed my whole relationship to mythology, and in that mm. sense also to imagination, that uh, something like, if I understand mythology as something like a sense organ, that oh, uh, perfect. Being, mm. be, being able to imagine something like an angel allows me a perception of something in my phenomenology that I'm not able to perceive without having something like a symbol, a myth, an imagination, 
And then uh, one can have whatever kind of relationship to this. One can have a meta metaphysical relationship or that, that. But the point is that uh, it's always cultural dependent. Uh, uh, Christian angels, or uh, let's talk about Mother Mary and, 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 the, and, the, and the Hindu goddess, they have different cultural connotations, but both in their mythology open up something in my sense perception that only that is only opening uh, wire, uh, symbol, imagination. And in that sense, it opens up, it opens me up to a reality that otherwise I'm not able to perceive. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely, that's perfect. <laughs> so, so there's, 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 you, you, I mean, I'm coming from biology, I'm going to use the biological term taxonomy. Um, there's, there's, so taxonomy is a kind of organization of categories, you know, so you've got the world, and there's things in it. And a taxonomy is the formal or informal organization of the things in the world. There's a good part to that and a bad part. The good part to taxonomy is that you now have words, names, adjectives, verbs. You have words like angel, <laughs> which you didn't have access to, to before. Most of what we see, we we own, we we don't look at very closely, mm -hmm. <laughs> and and we you're you're familiar with cognitive neuroscience. Um, you know, Anil Seth says the world is a controlled hallucination, um, and I think that fits very beautifully with a, that doctrine of of the imagination. The world is kind of a controlled hallucination, and some of the controls are somehow out there, but a lot of the controls are the language and the words that you have that allow you to frame things in certain ways. If you're, if you, if you commonly utilize angelological terminology, then that little flicker that you just caught out of the corner of your eye could maybe now be a little bit of an angel, whereas if you don't have that word or any of the associated mm -hmm. ideas and metaphors, and as you were saying, mythologies, mm -hmm. then you just then you just won't see it. This the anthropologists run into this let's, all the time. Let's stay a little moment with this flicker because I think that's uh, that's important because. Um, However, one is uh, one relates to angels, but uh, uh, we all have flickers, and uh, they may be meaningful or not. But my capacity to not miss them uh, depends on my capacity to have something that allows me to relate to it, and uh, that. The power of imagination, and it can be a religious, spiritual imagination, it can be poetic imagination is empowering that a flickering is more than a flickering that all of a sudden it's something that lives in myself and I can relate to. And in that, maybe I can discover something meaningful that if I would not have had the capacity to cut, to perceive it, I would have missed. In that sense, it's opening me up to a, a meaningful reality that without imagination, I would have not perceived. Perfect. It's, I, I, so there's there's two th two things to say about that, and I'll see if I can remember what. Uh, in in many, I was going to say most, but in many uh, of us, in the contemporary scientifically oriented world, even when you're using the category of angels, there's a little voice in the back of your head that says, yeah, well, it's all just chemistry. You know, it's, there's, there's, there's a reductive person 
lurking mm -hmm. <laughs> in many of us. You know, oh, I mean, Jung talked about he the the the, the nothing but the nicht als. It's only this. It's just chemistry. It's that was the that was the the little demon that I had to placate. I, I had to make him happy. Mm -hmm. I have now made him happy. Um, and, 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 and I needed authorities to make him happy. One of them was the, um, the, the scientist, uh, Jacob Bronowski, um, who was involved in the, the war, the Second World War. Um, and he did a program long, long, long ago, um, back in the seventies, that aired on BBC, I think. But we got it in we got it in the in in, in America, the United States too. Um, and he said he he made a distinction between truth and certainty, and he was he was a very um, highly cultured guy, you know. Mm -hmm. A brilliant scientist, but poetry and the literature and the arts were all very, very important to him. And he said that, that there's this primary distinction that everyone has to make, scientists especially, between certainty and truth. He said science is, 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 the, is the best way that we have, he thought, um, to get at truth with a small t but it can never get to certainty because every claim in the sciences is always hypothetical. Hmm. It's always a hypothesis. He says, it's when we scientists forget that, that things start to go off wrong. So that was, that was one thing I could say to my little reductive demon that, that kind of, calmed him down a little bit and all right all right that's true that's true we, as we know about neuroscience today i mean it's things that we didn't know before and we don't have to take them literally the other thing the other uh, little quick statement that i got that didn't quite complete the the the, the the task of relativizing the reductive demon, but it came close. James Hillman said that literalism is just another form of imagination. You don't have direct access to reality as it is in itself, whatever that mm -hmm. might be. But what we do have is a very strong psychological capacity to take things literally. Mm -hmm. And then he says, and that's a kind of imagination too. And I thought, well, of, that's, you know, that is so obviously true. Different people in different cultures take different things quite literally. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that there aren't rocks, <laughs> you know? I always have an object <laughs> that I can, and this gets me to point two, which was gonna be, I, I really love the natural sciences. I love, I'm mostly I'm a, trained as a biologist, but I got really interested in geology for a few years. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot about geology. And then later I learned about kind of biology that I didn't know about, which was botany. And here's the thing. If as, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a process, it's more, more obvious when it's a process, as you learn, say, a little geology, every time you go outside, you see things that you just never saw before. The same thing if you learn about botany. Oh my God, I had no idea there were so many plants out here. So, so my, my point is, it's very thrilling to think about this ability to experience 
a much wider range of phenomena um, th than you're used to. It's more exciting maybe to think about it in terms of angels, mm -hmm. but it's absolutely just as true with regard to science, the sciences. Um, Ye yes, uh, but there's something I, I, I would like to, to investigate with your little demon there. Uh, because uh, if your little demon basically makes the choice, uh, it's just chemistry. This flicker is just chemistry. Uh, the choice that this demon is making is also, it has no meaning. Oh yeah. <laughs> and, and that's, that's uh, basically the choice uh, that we developed as a cultural choice. Uh, and we, uh, we, we can discuss if, if this flicker is basically something that I name with uh, an angel uh, or with something else. What I do is that all of a sudden it, be, it, 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 it starts to have meaning. And then uh, we, 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 we can talk about it, if uh, is this rightful meaning or not, but it, it is a choice uh, this reductionism, this little demon makes the choice to basically uh, develop an imaginary that uh, renders the world meaningless. And what I find powerful in the imagination is to take it serious that there is a, um, a dimension where we live meaningful if I take it serious. And, and there is a language that allows me to put this meaning to open up. And it seems without this imagination, this meaningfulness of reality, whatever it is, and we can have different and we can disagree, but uh, uh, it's not accessible again. Mm -hmm. and, and that's part what I find so important about this imagination that uh, it takes serious that if I look closely, uh, it's not true that I live in a meaningless world. I, that's, that's I, right. I, I have to become a scientist to do that. As a human, I cannot do that. As a human, I always experience somehow meaningfulness. And if I take that serious, I have to define a language for that. Yeah, yes, yes. And um, one, of, one of the things to say about that is, well, the... <laughs> The, the meaninglessness of that reductive worldview, um, I, I, know what, I know what you mean by that, but the problem is that it, one of the problems is that it isn't really meaningless. It has, we're we going to way oversimplify things here, but if you, if, let's see, how would you say this? If you truly believed in a thoroughgoing um, reductive materialism so that everything was explicable, and I mean everything, mm -hmm. at the level of matter and energy and its mm -hmm. complications, and but nobody thinks that anymore because, well, there's very few people who think that anymore because anybody who does any real science at least recognizes that other things do emerge mm -hmm. <laughs> and that they then require more kinds of explanation. But let's, let's assume a kind of Laplacian universe mm -hmm. where if you knew all the laws, you could predict everything that nobody thinks that anymore. But it, but it was a seductive, it was a seductive kind of, uh, of rationalism for, for some time. It's not that it's meaningless it, it, in, in the strict sense. It's what its meaning is, is that power always wins and power is best. And, you, you know, it reduces things to mechanism and power relations. Uh, I, and I, I and that's simple. very bad. No, no, that, that's, that, that's very true. And that's an important aspect. Maybe I also have to be more precise with 
what I meant with meaning, because of course, in some sense it has, but what, what I really meant, it doesn't mean me. I am yes. not, I am not yes. meant. Yes. And that changes a lot. It changed. Yes. Yeah. So let me, let, let me say a little bit about Henri Corbin here. Yeah. Because this was central to, well, and, and, and to Jung and Hellman too. So Corbin's a theologian in what he liked to call the Abrahamic tradition, um, in which he included the Zoroastrians for, he was absolutely, utterly unique guy, thoroughly amazing. Um, but he was a theologian, he was a mystic, and he, therefore had a profound belief in the centrality of the person, human and divine, okay? And he had a horror of the collective. And he thought that uh, it wouldn't be too much to say, ah, but it would give the wrong impression. But I'll say it anyway, that all meaning is personal and that there can be no um, objective claims to absolute meaning that apply equally to all people in, in the following sense. I mean, this will make it precise. He was a Christian, but he was a very peculiar post-Islamic Christian. And he'd thought that the doctrine of the incarnation of Christ was the worst thing that had ever happened to the church. And I'll, I'll try to do this in terms of Corbin's vision of imagination. His feeling was, that if you, if you have a religion, Christianity, in which the transcendent God actually comes down in time, in history, in the flesh, then you have literalized your divinity in such a way that people will be able to look and say, that's God. I see God doing this. I'm going to write down exactly what God did. And then we're going to go tell everybody on the face of the earth what they should do, because we will then know God because we saw him and he talked to us. That makes Corbin very, very nervous because that's God, not a prophet. Prophets are different. Prophets are human. They screw things up, <laughs> you know, they're fallible. They're not transcendent. And Corbin's fine with prophets. It's this God thing that makes him nervous. And the reason for that is because <clears throat> the, 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 the canonical uh, story that he tells is from the, the, um, the apocryphal Gospel of Thomas. And I don't know, at Pentecost or at some at some time, Jesus or an angel, whoever it is, comes down to a group of people. And everybody's just totally blown away by this descent of transcendent light. And it happens for some length of time and then recedes to the heavens. And everybody looks at everybody else and they start to talk everybody saw something different. Everybody saw what they were able to see. And it's at that level of the phenomenology of religion that Corbin says, that's how religion has to work. It's got to be you and you and you, and none of this, um, he would say, yeah, you got to have, maybe you got to have some social structures here. But the only way you're going to encounter the Lord, which you can't, you only get it, you only get an angel. <laughs> you, you never get the transcendent God, for these reasons, it would be too dangerous, you know. 
all you can ever get is your own personal angel and you got to work pretty hard for that <laughs> but 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 therefore he agrees entirely with your claim that that meaning is always a lived meaning in an individual person mm -hmm. Yeah, let me go with what you just said, also with the story, because you uh, you transmitted something in relationship to however you want to call it, the sacred, the, abs the absolute, uh, in the relationship, uh, the danger that Cobra obviously said to, to make it literal with a person that, he, that you then can objectify, this is it, and I can write it down, uh, what it is, and in, in, in the end, uh, I, it's it's always I am asked to perceive it, and then we have different ways uh, uh, how we do. You brought this in the story of this uh, Thomas uh, uh, apocryphic. Uh, you are telling a story. This is imagination, uh, but the, because you were able to say that, you could make the point. And uh, you reach the point, at least with me, not just on a mental level, but something uh, reached me on, on an existential or a heartfelt understanding of what you are pointing to. And this is something, if you would try to, to have a scientific description of the way I think you describe, I doubt you would be able, uh, or I would not be able to understand on, this, on the level, I'm, I think I understand what you're saying this way. And this is the power that the imagination allows us to have also in human communication. Yeah. Independent how literally I take what you say. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. In fact, mm. <laughs> um, the, it, there's a sense in which the, 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 the most, the, the, the most intensely real experiences usually come through fiction <laughs> you, you know uh and it it takes it's that's very hard to talk about i think novelists and and literary scholars know it very well um but it's a little hard to get across any better than you just did to to the normal people but let me let me drag this down again to the level level of the rocks and biology, because I think because the point that you're making about story and imagination uh, covers everything, because even scientists don't talk like scientists. If you've ever even even people who you would think would be the most literal minded. If you've ever walked into a conference of mathematicians discussing their work, it's just an explosion of kinesthetics and imagination and excitement. And, and there is, they're seemingly talking about the most abstract and disembodied ideas and a few of them operate that way, you know, a few do, but many don't. They're, they engage with their work in an entirely embodied way. One of the great stories that I just heard about um, just a few months ago, and I have this on good authority, I can point to the references. Einstein was well known as being um, really, um, uh, kinesthetic in his in his mathematical work his wife says he'd be in the office struggling with something and he'd come out into the into the day room and play the piano a little bit and then he'd go back in and work and he said oh yeah music was the inspiration for many of my ideas mm. So and and I know just one other thing. I'll just go quickly. Um, if I want, when I was teaching biology to undergraduates, if you, you need to teach um, the cycles of metabolism, you have to tell it as a story. Otherwise, it's not even worth talking about. The the more you can personify your ATP and your you know all your enzymes, 
Um, and the more you can weave your cycles into a narrative, the more they're going to understand it. And the, the, that's the only reason they would care about it. Why would you care about it if it just sits there and it's marks on a page? Those marks are symbols. And symbols are always triggers for the imagination. I mean, you, you said it. Uh, wh why would you care about it? And uh, th that's uh, that's the human connection. That that's also um, when the relationship to the divine, to God. Uh, uh, there is no relationship if I don't care about it. But there must be something <laughs> yes. that allows me to care about it, and that is, in one way, my imagination, my capacity to envision, however I frame it, uh, whatever comes up with the divine, the sacred, or what, it, what is deeply meaningful, uh, if there's not something that speaks to me, I won't be able to grasp it. This just occurred to me to frame this this way. I'm thinking about my own experience with, with Corbin's work over the decades now. Um, and I, I always, I always, when I'm teaching his material online these days, I always make a, a, a big a big story about the um, creation myth that Corban adopts from Ibn Arabi, which involves the, the breathing out of the breath of the compassionate and then, then the return of that breath. Um, and, and that's a good story. And it is, maybe we'll talk about it sometime. But what I'm thinking right now is that, as I said, there was there was things in Corbin that I wouldn't have gotten, I think, and maybe anywhere else. And what I guess I needed was, and somehow in what you were saying, it 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 triggered this idea in me. I was. And I think likely many people are pretty, pretty closed in, pretty blinkered. It, in, you know, well, there's things you just don't think about. We don't, we don't do theology anymore. We don't, we don't think about God because, because we're, 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 you know, we're enlightenment individuals. We don't do those things. Or if we do think about God, we, we do it in this way, or if you're of another religion, well, you think about God in this way. And what Corbin and Hillman and Jung and then a lot of poets um, and other writers made so clear to me was that you could think as big as you want and you could, you could you could read Buddhism, you could read Christianity, you could read Judaism. Corbin is a, a great fan of all of the mystical traditions. And one of the puzzles about Corbin is that one, because he wrote a lot, and he wrote a lot about a lot of different um, mostly medieval um, uh, Islamic mystics. And people, people read all his, his work describing them, and, and you have to ask, well, what did he actually believe? First of all, th there is an answer to that question. But more important is, look at what he visited. <laughs> mm. You know, look at the places he went and inhabited you know he went he, you know world travelers know this it's it's like that you know he went to persia he went to india he went to he went all these places and like like an anthropologist an anthropo a phenomenological anthropologist he inhabited all of these places and he came he came back and then and then his world was just that much bigger. And at a certain point, it doesn't matter what he believed. One, one of my favorite quotes 
among the five or six that really had a lasting uh, impact on me, the the American poet um, Robert Duncan was giving a talk back in the 80s. And he said, you know, as a poet, I finally figured out that believing and imagining are two different systems. He says, if I believe something, then I can't imagine. And if I'm imagining, if I'm being a poet, well, I don't believe anything. I'm just imagining. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure that I would want to carry that over to Corbin because he was an advocate for the eternity of the individual soul. And so at some level, things were true or false for him in some ultimate sense. But while you're human, you should imagine as broadly as possible in order <laughs> to orient yourself. Uh, there's, there's a great quote, which uh, I won't be able to pull up. But let, let, me, let, me, let me say though, so, so in one of his books from the 1950s, Avicenna and the Visionary Recital, he explicitly talks about the conflict between the cosmopolitan West and his friends in, in the, you know, to early 20th century Iran, many of whom were traditional mullahs some of whom were living inside of Avicenna's cosmos, having never gone through Copernicus and Galileo and Newton and, you know, let alone Kant and Hegel. They were still living in, you know, effectively the 12th century. And he had enormous respect for them. They were living in Avicenna's world. And he says, well, you know, it's funny for me. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm a French Christianized philosophical theologian. And so my question is, what do I do about my, my love of Avicenna's cosmos? He says, now, for my, for my Iranian colleagues, they are inside his cosmos. And in fact, he says, I'm worried about them because they're taking it literally. And when they have interactions with the pluralistic cosmopolitan West, their literal framework is likely to crumble and leave them with very little or nothing, or with a lot of anger and a lot of violence. But he says at the same time, he wrote this whole book on Avicenna's visionary recitals. And he says, for us, Avicenna's world can live in me. So I take it seriously, but I don't take it literally. And then he spends, you know, 300 pages explaining Avicenna's cosmos and he's just in it and it's thrilling and there's hierarchies of angels and there's transformation and there's love and he's clearly completely in it but he's in it in a different way from his you know more fundamentalist friends and colleagues and if you take that story and then apply it all the way across everything in your life, then everything just opens up. Tom, we are also at the end of our time. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it was delightful.